Here now, since the tragic Beverly Hills fire, 165 people died in the blaze. Eyewitness News brought you the first live coverage of the tragedy. Reporter Kyle Hill was on the scene that night and has followed the story throughout the year. Tonight, the first in a 10-part series on what has happened since. Saturday, May the 28th, 1977, was a typical day in the tri-state. It was sunny and warm. The temperatures were in the mid-70s. And people spent the day doing the things that people normally do on a Saturday. Between three and 4,000 of them were anticipating a night out on the town at the showplace of the nation, Beverly Hills. And the people at Beverly Hills were also planning for a big weekend. Over 5,000 dinners were planned. There were at least two weddings, a bar mitzvah, several private parties, and John Davidson was the featured entertainer. He was extremely popular here. Throughout his engagement, he had consistently drawn large crowds. But the evening's fun was short-lived. About 9 o'clock, after several employees had smelled what seemed to be something burning in the zebra room, fire was discovered. Within minutes, the first units of the Southgate Fire Department were on the scene. We heard screaming, people screaming, and this, that, and the other. We knew we were in trouble, so I abandoned all lines that were being set up and helped the people out. We put six men in the front, two on the roof, and three in the back, and we got people out. Now, when did you call for additional help? Immediately. Coming up that driveway, I, I knew we had something because there was smoke coming out of the eaves. The rest of the night was a nightmare of death, destruction, fear, and heroism. Smoke, flames, and hot gases left the zebra room, traveling down corridors to other parts of the building. Between 1,000 and 1,300 people were in the cabaret room waiting for Davidson's act to begin. Busboy Walter Bailey jumped onto the stage and told people there was a fire. I'd get fired, but I just went up there and um, took the microphone away from one of the uh, entertainers and turned around and announced what was going. Well, I announced on how to get out first, then I announced uh, the exits, and I told everyone to start leaving, and then I told them there was a fire on the other side of the building not to go that way. Then came the smoke, black, toxic, choking. 150 people died in the cabaret room, including Davidson's music director. As survivors wandered about in varying states of shock, firemen from virtually every department in the area fought a losing battle. And as night turned to morning, it became obvious the showplace of the nation would take its place among the tragedies of the nation. Sunday dawned gray and blustery, and weary firemen, police, and National Guardsmen began the grim task of recovering the dead. That story, tonight at 11. Three construction experts hired by the Shillings, owners of the Beverly Hills Supper Club, cannot be questioned by attorneys representing the victims. Campbell County Judge John Diskin granted a protective order that, effect, uh, that took effect late this afternoon. James Osborne, the Shillings attorney, had argued that there was no need for the questioning because there was nothing new for the plaintiffs to discover. Judge Diskin issued the ru ruling orally. He promised to have it in writing by tomorrow. Well, it's now been almost a year since the Beverly Hills fire. 165 people died in that blaze. Tonight in part two, Kyle Hill traces the events of the day following the fire. It's now Sunday. An army of firemen, volunteers, state police, National Guardsmen are on the scene. Many have been here since the fire broke out. A soft, cold rain falls intermittently as searchers look for the missing victims. Thirty bodies were discovered on this day, most of them from the cabaret room. At the makeshift morgue in Fort Thomas's National Guard Armory, the grim task of identifying the victims continued, and autopsies were performed. The major cause of death was determined to be smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning. Memorial Day, Monday. The sun beats down mercilessly around the burned out ruins as several hundred rescuers continue searching for the missing. The last two would be found later in the week. State police sifted through the rubble for personal effects. And while all this was going on, a team of experts under the supervision of State Police Commissioner Kenneth Brandenburg began working on the question that was foremost in everyone's mind and would be for months to come. How and why did that fire start in the first place? Even today, a year later, the question is an answer to many people's satisfaction. And in the aftermath of the fire, a barrage of lawsuits that blankets the complete spectrum of liability in a manner that's never been done before in legal history. The investigation 
and the legal battles explain tomorrow when Beverly Hills one year later continues. I'm Kyle Hill reporting. Beverly Hills, the worst single fire disaster in the history of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, launched the largest scale investigation in the Commonwealth's history. Tonight, reporter Kyle Hill reviews that investigation. Governor Carroll placed the full resources of the Commonwealth at the disposal of the investigating team. Under the direction of State Police Commissioner Kenneth Brandenburg, State police, local, state, and national fire officials began sifting through the remains for the cause of the killer blaze. Others began looking through records of the burned out show place of the nation. A series of disturbing things began to emerge. Code violations dating back several years came to light. There was no complete set of plans for the building, which had been rebuilt and expanded several times since a fire gutted it in 1970. On June the 10th, a probable cause was announced. The investigation team has concluded that the fire originated in the concealed space of the zebra room. The most probable cause of ignition within this area was electrical in, na in nature and would have been fed by combustibles located therein. During the weeks that followed, the on-site team collected thousands of items of physical evidence. They were taken to the police crime laboratory in Frankfurt for analysis. Two and a half months later, Governor Carroll and his team of investigators presented their findings, a damning indictment of the inspection procedures and conditions at the club. They not only constructed the substantial portion of that club in clear violation of the law, using materials that were illegal, They operated it in violation of law. And even then, when a fire broke out, as it did on this disastrous night, failed to even use reasonable care to evacuate the premises. The governor immediately suspended three state officials, including Fire Marshal Warren Southworth. He also announced a complete reorganization of the fire marshal's office. The report delivered to a congressional committee looking into changes in the national fire code said the problems of Beverly Hills did not begin on May the 28th. They were in the making for years. Beverly Hills, the report said, was an accident waiting to happen. The cabaret room where most deaths occurred was overcrowded. There were not enough exits. Firewalls were not constructed where they were supposed to have been. Electrical wiring was inadequate. Employees had no fire or evacuation training. Hallways and corridors were too narrow, and some decorating materials may not have been up to flame spread standards. Although the governor's report did not indict, it did set the stage for a grand jury investigation, and a grand jury has been convened. It's meeting here at the Campbell County Courthouse. It is still hearing evidence. We'll have more at 11 o'clock tonight. Beverly Hills Fire. On the early news, reporter Kyle Hill told of changes in the fire marshal's office and the convening of a grand jury. This is a result of the governor's investigation into the fire. Tonight, the charges answered and a deluge of damage suits. During these months following the fire, the Schilling family, the owners of Beverly Hills, have remained silent. Only once have they met with reporters. This, shortly after release of the governor's report. And even then, they spoke through their attorney. ...and without precedent, Governor Carroll has assumed the role of special prosecutor for Campbell County, judge and jury. His remarks, his report and remarks carry with them an aura of finality without an opportunity of defense and benefit of trial. Such conclusiveness should not be accepted by the public. Certainly, it is not accepted by us. His remarks were not only unwarranted, but were also defamatory, scurrilous, irresponsible, and unprofessional. The governor has used this report as the stage for politically motivated remarks serving his own political end. 
The position was that it would be improper to comment further in public because of the lawsuits filed by the survivors. The first of those lawsuits was filed on June the 3rd. They now total almost $2 billion. There can be no doubt about it next April when the cases go to trial, the eyes of the legal community will be on northern Kentucky courthouses. Last December, federal judge Carl Rubin created a class action of the many claims. He made it one suit to, as he put it, keep things from becoming a race to the courtroom door with prizes for a few winners. Rubin's decision is also worded so, if fault is found against any of the defendants, one single jury can determine the damages. Rubin in federal court and Judge John Diskin in state court have ruled Kentucky and the city of Southgate may claim sovereign immunity. Those decisions are being appealed, but attorneys for survivors continue to add defendants. The governor's report on the fire noted safety and fire code violations at the club and indicated materials used in the building may have contributed to the spread of the fire. Well, attorneys for the survivors have jumped on these statements. Some of the largest companies in the world now find themselves in the middle of a legal battle. DuPont, Reynolds Aluminum, BF Goodrich, General Electric, even fire underwriters laboratories and insurance companies are included. The last day for filing is less than a week away now. Attorneys could file more suits. However, the court has ruled the attorneys may not seek out survivors and ask if they want to file. So voluminous are the suits, the last batch was delivered to the clerk of courts in a panel truck. It added 970 manufacturers and insurance companies. Finally, not the least of the concerns is finding a courtroom big enough to handle all the participants in this trial. Tomorrow we'll be looking at some of the accomplishments of this past year in state government. Kentucky Governor Julian Carroll left Frankfurt immediately upon hearing of the fire at Beverly Hills. He spent the night at the scene and during the following days was right in the middle of the activity. Kyle Hill reports in this segment of Beverly Hills one year later that the governor had two things paramount on his mind. First two things were why the fire started in the first place and secondly, the governor wanted to ensure that another Beverly Hills tragedy would never happen here in the Commonwealth. As we reported yesterday, the governor's report on Beverly Hills spells out in very explicit terms how and why that fire started. The governor then pledged that he would protect the state through legislation and through a strong state fire marshal's office. Well, a year has passed now, and are Kentuckians protected by a strong fire code? No, they are not, and the governor is not happy about it. I am dissatisfied with the legislation that did not adopt a statewide mandatory system uh, for the whole state. We did get um, uh, some of our legislation on the books, but uh, we were not able to get a mandatory statewide fire code for everybody. Why? Uh, there was a substantial amount of concern among some of our rural friends, as well as some of our municipal friends who really did not feel like that they ought to comply with a mandatory fire code on a statewide basis that maybe it would be too expensive. Um, I really guess, Kyle, in the final analysis, you should have to say that the memory of Beverly Hills did not linger long enough. There can be no mistaking, though, the governor is but one voice in the legislative chorus. His power here is limited. But in the fire marshal's office, it's another matter. And here we have seen dramatic changes in the past year. We'll look at those changes tonight at 11 o'clock. As we reported on the 5.30 news this evening, Kentucky Governor Carroll is not happy with the progress made in the legislature strengthening fire codes. But Kyle Hill reports much progress has been made in the state fire marshal's office. During that critical week following the tragic fire at Beverly Hills, Eyewitness News reported exclusively we had discovered there were fire code violations at Beverly Hills. I was the first reporter to gain access to the records of Beverly Hills that were then housed here at the new state office building in Frankfurt. And frankly, they were a mess. 
There were lists of violations dating back three and four years with no evidence they were ever corrected. And there was no complete set of plans of Beverly Hills on file. In the investigative report to the governor on the Beverly Hills fire, there was one sentence, and I quote, however, Beverly Hills continued to operate, although many of these code violations were known by the insurer, the operators, and the owners, and were noted as concerns as a matter of record to the fire marshal's office. One of the first things Governor Carroll did following the release of this report was to completely reorganize the fire marshal's office. Robert Estep was named as state fire marshal. It's been nine months since Estep took over. Much has been accomplished. For example, 22 new inspectors have been hired. A staff of three attorneys now work full time in prosecuting anyone who refuses to comply to the fire code. Records of the state's 25,000 public buildings are being put in a sophisticated computer. Inspectors will be automatically notified when a grace period is over for a building that has violations. 15 days later and two more contacts Owners will be prosecuted. Estep is happy about the progress, but he admits they have a long way to go. We're, we're farther down the road now than we were 12 months ago. There's not a doubt in my mind about it. But there was so much progress to be made that it's going to take longer than a year to make it. The possibility of another Beverly Hills is more remote than it was 12 months ago. I, I wish nothing would please me more than to tell you or to make the firm statement that we have no problems, but we still have problems. Uh, each day we leave, leave the office, we hope that we have accomplished something. But uh, percentage-wise, there's so much to accomplish. And it's something that you can't do overnight. The report on Beverly Hills points out in its conclusions that those who insured Beverly Hills, the owners and operators, and even the state fire inspectors knew of the dangers in Beverly Hills. The report concludes that the only ones who didn't know about the dangers here were the patrons. Tomorrow, we'll take a look at how the Beverly Hills tragedy affected the lives of those involved in Beverly Hills. I'm Kyle Hill reporting. Thank you very much, Mike. Many of those who survived the Beverly Hills fire have suffered injuries that will last long after the showplace of the nation has itself been bulldozed from view. Their injuries are both physical and psychological. Tonight, Kyle Hill reports on how some are making out and what the medical community is doing with the experience gained from the tragedy. It's estimated over 3,000 people were in Beverly Hills the night of the fire. And when word went out to area hospitals they might be receiving large numbers of casualties, there was momentary concern. But that concern was short-lived. Every hospital in the area handled the casualties without a problem. And this is because they all had disaster plans. We have tried to expand our disaster capability in that we are finishing up the installation of an emergency medical service heliport, which will be open very shortly. We've also equipped a surplus Army vehicle as a disaster field team vehicle. The night of the Beverly Hills fire, we were amazed at how rapidly people went into total respiratory distress. And, respiratory distress means just uh, to the average person. <laughs> having tremendous difficulty in breathing or even breathing stoppage. Uh, also, some of the people suffered uh, an amount of damage to their lung tissue from the, the uh, vapors and so forth that they breathed. And over 70 life squads and rescue units responded to Beverly Hills, many of them from volunteer departments. And again, they were prepared. Life squad training is second nature for these people. Bruce Rath, a Fort Thomas fireman, pulled between 30 and 40 people from the blazing building. This woman had been pronounced dead, but she's alive today because of Bruce Rath. I know I got a lot of guff from my wife at times, but <laughs> I think she really, with this disaster hitting she really came around to the point where she you know maybe it isn't all bad it finally paid off the training and hours I put in and now I'm teaching CPR with Northern Kentucky Health Department and the American Red Cross and uh, she's taking the course and my boys are getting ready to take it and trying to get it there's a very large uh, response from all the Northern Kentucky residents and especially here in the Campbell County yeah. area we're uh, we're setting up programs and um, 
teaching, and we hope to get at least one person in every family trained. And I think with this goal, uh, we can be the tools of the good Lord to, to help this, you know, maybe the world be a little bit better, nicer, safer place to live in. Ron Lape was the most seriously burned. The story of his survival is a study in bravery and a tribute to the medical profession. He arrived home this week from a Boston hospital. It feels good just being able to talk. Just for a while I had talk with electric larynx. Now I can talk and uh, I got an artificial like uh, this T-tube guy, the doctor in Boston invented it, put it in. I'm getting along good with it. Well, I feel good to be home, and it feels good to be outside. I haven't been outside for about six months. But the psychological effects on the survivors of Beverly Hills have been the most serious. Tonight at 11, we'll look at that. Set up the night sky and the scream of sirens from ambulances and fire engines filled the smoky night air around Beverly Hills last May 28th. A team of rescuers of a different kind was quietly swinging into operation. On the hill below the blazing nightclub, Red Cross and Salvation Army volunteers set up crisis centers for those wandering around in shock. And the next day, a permanent team of social workers, counselors, and psychiatrists was formed. The fire aftermath team is still in operation today here at the University of Cincinnati's College of Medicine. And on Sunday, the anniversary of the fire, the team will be keeping constant vigil, waiting for calls from the troubled. It's estimated 3,000 people were involved in the fire, and that doesn't count the hundreds of police and firemen and volunteers who were on the scene that night. The fire aftermath team was established to help anyone connected with the fire to handle what they had gone through. We've seen a number of uh, psychological and emotional symptoms, principally consisting of uh, phobias uh, for fire and smoke, or one might really call it, rather than a phobia, an extra sensitivity to uh, experiencing fire, smoke, and uh, crowded places. People avoid uh, uh, crowded places. Partly this is uh, a fear and partly it's an adaptive response because after all crowded places are where one might be caught in such a disaster again. I think that we're entering the phase where uh, there may be a continuing withdrawal from uh, daily activities. And this of course is the most uh, serious and insidious aspect of the syndrome that we're working with. The uh, symptoms and so on are, uh, tend to fade away at this point, but it's a change in way of life uh, as a result of their experience that is perhaps the most disabling, and that's what our therapy is out to try to uh, prevent. Julie and Randy Ross survived the Beverly Hills fire. Although both were hospitalized, they have recovered. Tomorrow, we'll visit with them and see how life is in May of 1978. I'm Kyle Hill reporting. The governor of Ohio today... No one knows for sure, but it is estimated that there were more than 3,000 people in Beverly Hills the night of the fire. 165 died, 100 were injured. Eyewitness News talked with two of those injured in two days after the fire. Tonight, Kyle Hill shows us what has happened to the couple since the tragedy. May the 28th, 1977 was to be a special night for Julie Weingart and Randy Ross. The Dayton couple had dated for several months, and on this night, Randy had planned to pop the question to Julie. He did. She answered yes. But the life they pledged to spend together almost ended before it began. From hospital beds, their voices hoarse from smoke and flames, they told of the horror inside the crowded cabaret room. We both fell down. We tripped over somebody that had fallen in front of us. And when I got back up, I had hold of some other lady's arm. It wasn't Jolie's. And right then, the black smoke just engulfed us. And the only thing I could think of was getting out. Randy and I got to get separated probably about 15 feet from the exit. And uh, the, the boy that went on stage and started, mm -hmm. he's the one that pulled me out. Life is better today. It's now Mr. and Mrs. Randall Ross, and they're expecting their first child. We've gone through a lot of uh, things that weren't related to the fire that were uh, this last year have been pretty hectic, but 
I guess as far as recovering from it physically, there, I can still tell that, that you know, it has happened. Um, my lung capacity and things like that aren't what they used to be, but it doesn't limit me very much. I, I'm, I especially am really afraid of fires. Like, we got some gift certificates for a wedding gift, and we went out and bought two smoke alarms. <laughs> <laughs> what about when you go out? Do you unconsciously l look? No, not unconsciously. <laughs> <You> consciously <laughs> look. Very it's, uh, it's something that's really present. The scary part for me was, well, like, as soon as you got out, the time between when you realized that you might die and when you got out, you kind of turned into almost an animal. And you were really scared, but I was really frightened when I looked back and saw what had almost happened. That was real scary for me. And then, of course, not knowing what happened to Randy, that was scary too. If I think about the first, the first time I'd ever realized, when I was in Beverly Hills, the first time that I realized that the, the threat of a fire wasn't just a threat, it was, an, it was something that was going to kill me, you know. I, when the flames came into the cabaret room, I guess, um, I'll never be able to forget that. That's, that's about the only thing that really scares me if I think back about it. And tomorrow night on the final segment of the Beverly Hills Fire one year later, some personal observations. I'm Kyle Hill reporting. Beverly Hills today looks much different than it did a year ago. During the past week, construction crews have been leveling the burned-out hulk that has been a constant reminder of the horror of that night one year ago. No one who had any connection with the fire is the same today. The families and friends of the dead, the injured, the survivors, firemen, police, volunteers, and even the reporters and photographers who covered the tragedy. And certainly not the lives of the Schilling family or the employees of Beverly Hills. There was but one thing I wanted to portray in this series. It was not the horror of that night nor the days that followed because they speak for themselves. And it was not to affix blame. That is the job of the courts. Nor has it been to intrude into the lives of the survivors and lay bare again their personal losses. My purpose has been to show what has happened in the year to protect us from another Beverly Hills disaster. And no one is so naive as to believe that we can guarantee that. One of the things I remember about Beverly Hills and the days that followed the fire was Governor Julian Carroll. He swore that he would get the necessary legislation through to protect Kentuckians. But as we have shown you in this series, the legislature hasn't responded with a strong state fire code. The fire marshal's office has been upgraded. The new fire marshal, Bob Estep, told us that they have made progress. But he also said, come back in a year and see how much more has been done. Well, you can rest assured our cameras will be in his office next May. It's heartening and encouraging to see the victims of the fire refusing to quit, struggling to overcome their injuries, and to see the medical community using the tragedy to better prepare themselves. In the decades to come, the memory of Beverly Hills is going to dim and it's going to take its place in the record books. The tragedy and the horror of that muggy May night will be reduced to mere statistics, just like a half dozen other fires in our country. But maybe this loss and the suffering won't seem quite so senseless if we have learned from our mistakes, and if, hopefully, it never happens again. I'm Kyle Hill reporting. John Elder, the cinematographer who worked with Kyle Hill on our Beverly Hills series, has filmed a final tribute to those who were killed at the Supper Club one year ago today. Here is his memorial to the victims and to those left behind. <laughs>